Part two, chapter six. Pyotr Stepanovitch is busy. Section four. Though Pyotr Stepanovitch was perhaps far from being a stupid man, Fedka the convict had said of him truly that he would make up a man himself and go on living with him too. He came away from Lemke fully persuaded that for the next six days anyway he had put his mind at rest and this interval was absolutely necessary for his own purposes. But it was a false idea and founded entirely on the fact that he had made up for himself once for all an Andrei Antonovitch who was a perfect simpleton. Like every morbidly suspicious man, Andrei Antonovitch was always exceedingly and joyfully trustful the moment he got onto sure ground. The new turn of affairs struck him at first in a rather favorable light, in spite of some fresh and troublesome complications. Anyway, his former doubts fell to the ground. Besides, he had been so tired for the last few days, so exhausted and helpless, that his soul involuntarily yearned for rest. But alas, he was again uneasy. The long time he had spent in Petersburg had left ineradicable traces in his heart. The official and even the secret history of the younger generation was fairly familiar to him. He was a curious man and used to collect manifestos, but he could never understand a word of it. Now he felt like a man lost in a forest. Every instinct told him that there was something in Pyotr Stepanovitch's words utterly incongruous, anomalous, and grotesque though there's no telling what may not happen with this younger generation, and the devil only knows what's going on among them, he mused, lost in perplexity. And at this moment, to make matters worse, Bloom poked his head in. He had been waiting not far off through the whole of Pyotr Stepanovitch's visit. This Bloom was actually a distant relation of Andrei Antonovitch, though the relationship had always been carefully and timorously concealed. I must apologize to the reader for devoting a few words here to this insignificant person. Bloom was one of that strange class of unfortunate Germans who are unfortunate not through lack of ability, but through some inexplicable ill luck. Unfortunate Germans are not a myth, but really do exist even in Russia, and are of a special type. Andrei Antonovitch had always had a quite touching sympathy for him, and wherever he could, as he rose himself in the service, had promoted him to subordinate positions under him. But Bloom had never been successful. Either the post was abolished after he had been appointed to it, or a new chief took charge of the department. Once he was almost arrested by mistake with other people. He was precise, but he was gloomy to excess and to his own detriment. He was tall and had red hair. He stooped and was depressed and even sentimental. And in spite of his being humbled by his life, he was obstinate and persistent as an ox, though always at the wrong moment. For Andrei Antonovitch, he, as well as his wife and numerous family, had cherished for many years a reverent devotion. Except Andrei Antonovitch, no one had ever liked him. Yulia Mikhailovna would have discarded him from the first, but could not overcome her husband's obstinacy. It was the cause of their first conjugal quarrel. It had happened soon after their marriage, in the early days of their honeymoon, when she was confronted with Bloom, who, together with the humiliating secret of his relationship, had been until then carefully concealed from her. Andrei Antonovitch besought her with clasped hands, told her pathetically all the story of Bloom and their friendship from childhood, but Yulia Mikhailovna considered herself disgraced forever, and even had recourse to fainting. Von Lemke would not budge an inch, and declared that he would not give up Bloom or part from him for anything in the world, so that she was surprised at last and was obliged to put up with Bloom. It was settled, however, that the relationship should be concealed even more carefully than before, if possible, and that even Bloom's Christian name and patronymic should be changed, because he too was for some reason called Andrei Antonovitch. Bloom knew no one in the town except the German chemist, had not called on anyone, and led, as he always did, a lonely and niggardly existence. He had long been aware of Andrei Antonovitch's literary peccadilloes. He was generally summoned to listen to secret tete-a-tete -tete readings of his novel. He would sit like a post for six hours at a stretch, perspiring and straining his utmost to keep awake and smile. On reaching home, he would groan with his long-legged and lanky wife, 
over their benefactor's unhappy weakness for russian literature andrey antonovitch looked with anguish at bloom i beg you to leave me alone bloom he began with agitated haste obviously anxious to avoid any renewal of the previous conversation which had been interrupted by pyotr stepanovitch and yet this may be arranged in the most delicate way and with no publicity you have full power bloom respectfully but obstinately insisted on some point stooping forward and coming nearer and nearer by small steps to andrey antonovitch bloom you are so devoted to me and so anxious to serve me that i am always in a panic when i look at you you always say witty things and sleep in peace satisfied with what you've said but that's how you damage yourself bloom i have just convinced myself that it's quite a mistake quite a mistake not from the words of that false vicious young man whom you suspect yourself he has won you by his flattering praise of your talent for literature bloom you understand nothing about it your project is absurd i tell you we shall find nothing and there will be a fearful upset and laughter too and then yulia mihailovna we shall certainly find everything we are looking for bloom advanced firmly towards him laying his right hand on his heart we will make a search suddenly early in the morning carefully showing every consideration for the person himself and strictly observing all the prescribed forms of the law the young men lyamshin and telyatnikov assert positively that we shall find all we want they were constant visitors there nobody is favourably disposed to mr verkovensky madame stavrogin has openly refused him her graces and every honest man if only there is such a one in this coarse town is persuaded that a hotbed of infidelity and social doctrines has always been concealed there he keeps all the forbidden books Relief's reflections all herzen's works i have an approximate catalogue in case of need oh heavens every one has these books how simple you are my poor bloom and many manifestos bloom went on without heeding the observation we shall end by certainly coming upon traces of the real manifestos here that young verkovensky i feel very suspicious of but you are mixing up the father and the son they are not on good terms the son openly laughs at his father that's only a mask bloom you've sworn to torment me think he is a conspicuous figure here after all he's been a professor he is a well-known man he'll make such an uproar and there will be such jibes all over the town and we shall make a mess of it all and only think how yulia mihailovna will take it bloom pressed forward and did not listen he was only a lecturer only a lecturer and of a low rank when he retired he smote himself on the chest he has no marks of distinction he was discharged from the service on suspicion of plots against the government he has been under secret supervision and undoubtedly still is so and in view of the disorders that have come to light now you are undoubtedly bound in duty you are losing your chance of distinction by letting slip the real criminal yulia mihailovna get away bloom von lemke cried suddenly hearing the voice of his spouse in the next room bloom started but did not give in allow me allow me he persisted pressing both hands still more tightly on his chest get away hissed andrey antonovitch do what you like afterwards oh my god the curtain was raised and yulia mihailovna made her appearance she stood still majestically at the sight of bloom casting a haughty and offended glance at him as though the very presence of this man was an affront to her bloom respectfully made her a deep bow without speaking and doubled up with veneration moved towards the door on tiptoe with his arms held a little away from him either because he really took andrey antonovitch's last hysterical outbreak as a direct permission to act as he was asking or whether he strained a point in this case for the direct advantage of his benefactor because he was too confident that success would crown his efforts anyway as we shall see later on this conversation of the governor with his subordinate led to a very surprising event which amused many people became public property moved yulia mihailovna to fierce anger utterly disconcerting andrey antonovitch and reducing him at the crucial moment to a state of deplorable indecision section five it was a busy day for pyotr stepanovitch from von lemke he hastened to bogoyavlensky street 
but as he went along bikovy street past the house where karmazinov was staying he suddenly stopped grinned and went into the house the servant told him that he was expected which interested him as he had said nothing beforehand of his coming but the great writer really had been expecting him not only that day but the day before and the day before that three days before he had handed him his manuscript merci which he had meant to read at the literary matinee at yulia mihailovna's fete he had done this out of amiability fully convinced that he was agreeably flattering the young man's vanity by letting him read the great work beforehand pyotr stepanovitch had noticed long before that this vainglorious spoiled gentleman who was so offensively unapproachable for all but the elect this writer with the intellect of a statesman was simply trying to curry favour with him even with avidity i believe the young man guessed at last that karmazinov considered him if not the leader of the whole secret revolutionary movement in russia at least one of those most deeply initiated into the secrets of the russian revolution who had an incontestable influence on the younger generation the state of mind of the cleverest man in russia interested pyotr stepanovitch but hitherto he had for certain reasons avoided explaining himself the great writer was staying in the house belonging to his sister who was the wife of a kammerherr and had an estate in the neighbourhood both she and her husband had the deepest reverence for their illustrious relation but to their profound regret both of them happened to be in moscow at the time of his visit so that the honour of receiving him fell to the lot of an old lady a poor relation of the kammerherrs who had for years lived in the family and looked after the housekeeping all the household had moved about on tiptoe since karmazinov's arrival the old lady sent news to moscow almost every day how he had slept what he had deigned to eat and had once sent a telegram to announce that after a dinner party at the mayor's he was obliged to take a spoonful of a well-known medicine she rarely plucked up courage to enter his room though he behaved courteously to her but dryly and only talked to her of what was necessary when pyotr stepanovitch came in he was eating his morning cutlet with half a glass of red wine pyotr stepanovitch had been to see him before and always found him eating this cutlet which he finished in his presence without ever offering him anything after the cutlet a little cup of coffee was served the footman who brought in the dishes wore a swallow-tail coat noiseless boots and gloves Aha! karmazinov got up from the sofa wiping his mouth with a table napkin and came forward to kiss him with an air of unmixed delight after the characteristic fashion of russians if they are very illustrious but pyotr stepanovitch knew by experience that though karmazinov made a show of kissing him he really only proffered his cheek and so this time he did the same the cheeks met karmazinov did not show that he noticed it sat down on the sofa and affably offered pyotr stepanovitch an easy chair facing him in which the latter stretched himself at once you don't wouldn't like some lunch inquired karmazinov abandoning his usual habit but with an air of course which would prompt a polite refusal pyotr stepanovitch at once expressed a desire for lunch a shade of offended surprise darkened the face of his host but only for an instant he nervously rang for the servant and in spite of all his breeding raised his voice scornfully as he gave orders for a second lunch to be served what will you have cutlet or coffee he asked once more a cutlet and coffee and tell him to bring some more wine i am hungry answered pyotr stepanovitch calmly scrutinizing his host's attire mr karmazinov was wearing a sort of indoor wadded jacket with pearl buttons but it was too short which was far from becoming to his rather comfortable stomach and the solid curves of his hips but tastes differ over his knees he had a checkered woolen plaid reaching to the floor though it was warm in the room are you unwell commented pyotr stepanovitch no not unwell but i am afraid of being so in this climate answered the writer in his squeaky voice though he uttered each word with a soft cadence and agreeable gentlemanly lisp i've been expecting you since yesterday why i didn't say i'd come no but you have my manuscript have you read it manuscript which one karmazinov was terribly surprised 
But you brought it with you, haven't you? He was so disturbed that he even left off eating and looked at Pyotr Stepanovitch with a face of dismay. Ah, that bonjour, you mean. Merci. Oh, all right. I'd quite forgotten it and hadn't read it. I haven't had time. I really don't know. It's not in my pockets. It must be on my table. Don't be uneasy. It will be found. No, I'd better send you to your rooms at once. It might be lost. Besides, it might be stolen. Oh, who'd want it? But why are you so alarmed? Why, Yulia Mikhailovna told me you always have several copies made. One kept at a notary's abroad, another in Petersburg, a third in Moscow, and then you send some to a bank, I believe. But Moscow might be burnt again, and my manuscript with it. No, I'd better send at once. Stay, here it is. Pyotr Stepanovitch pulled a roll of notepaper out of a pocket at the back of his coat it's a little crumpled only fancy it's been lying there with my pocket handkerchief ever since i took it from you i forgot it karmazinov greedily snatched the manuscript carefully examined it counted the pages and laid it respectfully beside him on a special table for the time in such a way that he would not lose sight of it for an instant you don't read very much it seems he hissed unable to restrain himself no not very much and nothing in the way of russian literature in the way of russian literature hm let me see i have read something on the way or away or at the parting of the ways something of the sort i don't remember it's a long time since i read it five years ago i've no time a silence followed when i came i assured everyone that you were a very intelligent man and now I believe everyone here is wild over you. Thank you, Pyotr Stepanovitch answered calmly. Lunch was brought in. Pyotr Stepanovitch pounced on the cutlet with extraordinary appetite, had eaten it in a trice, tossed off the wine, and swallowed his coffee. This boor, thought Karmazinov, looking at him askance as he munched the last morsel and drained the last drops. This boor probably understood the biting taunt in my words, and no doubt he has read the manuscript with eagerness. He is simply lying with some object. But possibly he is not lying and is only genuinely stupid. I like a genius to be rather stupid. Mayn't he be a sort of genius among them? Devil take the fellow. He got up from the sofa and began pacing from one end of the room to the other for the sake of exercise, as he always did after lunch. Leaving here soon, asked Pyotr Stepanovitch from his easy chair, lighting a cigarette. I really came to sell an estate, and I am in the hands of my bailiff. You left, I believe, because they expected an epidemic out there after the war. No, not entirely for that reason, Mr. Karmazinov went on, uttering his phrases with an affable intonation, and each time he turned round in pacing the corner there was a faint but jaunty quiver of his right leg. I certainly intend to live as long as I can, he laughed, not without venom. There is something in our Russian nobility that makes them wear out very quickly, from every point of view. But I wish to wear out as late as possible, and now I am going abroad for good. There the climate is better, the houses are of stone and everything stronger. Europe will last my time, I think. What do you think? How can I tell? Hmm. If the Babylon out there really does fall, and great will be the fall thereof, about which I quite agree with you, yet I think it will last my time, there's nothing to fall here in Russia, comparatively speaking. There won't be stones to fall, everything will crumble into dirt. Holy Russia has less power of resistance than anything in the world. The Russian peasantry is still held together somehow by the Russian god. But according to the latest accounts, the Russian god is not to be relied upon, and scarcely survived the emancipation. It certainly gave him a severe shock. And now, what with railways, what with you, I've no faith in the Russian god. And how about the European one? I don't believe in any. I've been slandered to the youth of Russia. I've always sympathized with every movement among them. I was shown the manifestos here. Everyone looks at them with perplexity because they are frightened at the way things are put in them. But everyone is convinced of their power, even if they don't admit it to themselves. Everybody has been rolling downhill, and everyone has known for ages that they have nothing to clutch at. 
i am persuaded of the success of this mysterious propaganda if only because russia is now pre-eminently the place in all the world where anything you like may happen without any opposition i understand only too well why wealthy russians all flock abroad and more and more so every year it's simply instinct if the ship is sinking the rats are the first to leave it holy russia is a country of wood of poverty and of danger the country of ambitious beggars in its upper classes while the immense majority live in poky little huts she will be glad of any way of escape you have only to present it to her it's only the government that still means to resist but it brandishes its cudgel in the dark and hits its own men everything here is doomed and awaiting the end russia as she is has no future i have become a german and i am proud of it but you began about the manifestos tell me everything how do you look at them everyone is afraid of them so they must be influential they openly unmask what is false and prove that there is nothing to lay hold of among us and nothing to lean upon they speak aloud while all is silent what is most effective about them in spite of their style is the incredible boldness with which they look the truth straight in the face to look facts straight in the face is only possible to russians of this generation no in europe they are not yet so bold it is a realm of stone there there is still something to lean upon so far as i see and am able to judge the whole essence of the russian revolutionary idea lies in the negation of honour i like its being so boldly and fearlessly expressed no in europe they wouldn't understand it yet but that's just what we shall clutch at for a russian a sense of honour is only a superfluous burden and it always has been a burden through all his history the open right to dishonour will attract him more than anything i belong to the older generation and i must confess still cling to honour but only from habit it is only that i prefer the old forms granted it's from timidity you see one must live somehow what's left of one's life he suddenly stopped i am talking he thought while he holds his tongue and watches me he has come to make me ask him a direct question and i shall ask him yulia mikhailovna asked me by some stratagem to find out from you what the surprise is that you are preparing for the ball to-morrow pyotr stepanovitch asked suddenly yes there really will be a surprise and i certainly shall astonish said karmazinov with increased dignity but i won't tell you what the secret is pyotr stepanovitch did not insist there is a young man here called shatov observed the great writer would you believe it i haven't seen him a very nice person what about him oh nothing he talks about something isn't he the person who gave stavrogin that slap in the face yes and what's your opinion of stavrogin i don't know he is such a flirt karmazinov detested stavrogin because it was the latter's habit not to take any notice of him that flirt he said chuckling if what is advocated in your manifestos ever comes to pass will be the first to be hanged perhaps before pyotr stepanovitch said suddenly quite right too karmazinov assented not laughing and with pronounced gravity you have said so once before and do you know i repeated it to him what you surely didn't repeat it karmazinov laughed again he said that if he were to be hanged it would be enough for you to be flogged not simply as a compliment but to hurt as they flog the peasants pyotr stepanovitch took his hat and got up from his seat karmazinov held out both his hands to him at parting and what if all that you are plotting for is destined to come to pass he piped suddenly in a honeyed voice with a peculiar intonation still holding his hands in his how soon could it come about how could i tell pyotr stepanovitch answered rather roughly they looked intently into each other's eyes at a guess approximately karmazinov piped still more sweetly you'll have time to sell your estate and time to clear out too pyotr stepanovitch muttered still more roughly they looked at one another even more intently there was a minute of silence it will begin early next may and will be over by october pyotr stepanovitch said suddenly i thank you sincerely karmazinov pronounced in a voice saturated with feeling pressing his hands you will have time to get out of the ship you rat pyotr stepanovitch was thinking as he went out into the street 
well if that imperial intellect inquires so confidently of the day and the hour and thanks me so respectfully for the information i have given we mustn't doubt of ourselves he grinned hm but he really isn't stupid and he is simply a rat escaping men like that don't tell tales he ran to filipov's house in bogoyavlensky street end of part two chapter six section five